We're going to start this interview a little bit early here. It's scheduled for 8, but we're, we've got the senator here, and we respect his uh, time and his, uh, his uh, willingness to come and visit with us. And, of course, uh, tomorrow begins early voting, so uh, you work this into your schedule, a uh, tight schedule, uh, on quick notice, actually, to uh, come in here before early voting started. We're on Facebook right now, and you can put a question up there on Facebook if you like, or you can send me a phone text, as several of you have, at 213-802-8651, or you can call in. Diana's here to answer the phone and transfer your call in here, and we can take some calls live on the radio. Senator Seliger, thank you for coming. As always, thank you for having me on. I appreciate you coming. Uh, you were really busy the last time I came down to Austin. I don't go, go down there very often, but I came last March, and uh, you were so busy they they wouldn't even uh, take a moment to tell you I was there. So I signed your book and, and went to see Smithy. <laughs> <laughs> Which was probably a good visit, but it you're was. welcome anytime. And thank let me you. know next time, make sure that. We have some time to talk. I'll give you a little advance notice because you've always been uh, very cordial and friendly and uh, and willing to take time to talk to me. And I thank you for that. I, it's a pleasure every time. I appreciate you you having me on regularly and and uh, you do a good interview and well, and I, I've done a lot of them. Oh, and you've done a lot of town hall meetings too. I've done four hundred eleven. Woo! And it's something that I think that somebody in my position is obligated to do. Uh-huh. And so after every session or before every session, I go to every county I represent to look people in the eye that I represent and uh-huh. say, what did I do right? What could I have done better? What do you want me to do next yeah. January? Uh, I've done more town hall meetings than anybody else in the legislature. I'm a little troubled because nobody running against me says I'm going to do the same thing and travel my whole district all the time Uh because some of the counties politically don't necessarily mean a lot. Loving County only has 84 permanent Mm -hmm. residents, and only nine people voted in the last Republican primary there. Really, (laughs) But those citizens, voters, are important as Uh any others. Well, their vote counts as much as mine does. Of course it does. You're just in a more concentrated group because you live in Amarillo. Yeah. Well, I've got you uh, pictured here now. I've turned the cameras so they can see you on our webcam or they can see you on Facebook. And uh, let me start off. I really look just a lot better on radio. (laughs) That's funny. I like that. (laughs) Uh, I want to uh, mention some some positive things before I get to some more tough questions that people have submitted to me and okay. a couple that I had myself. But I mean, you've been around long enough, you know you know about all the tough questions. And people, sure, I do. You know, not everybody that shows up at your town halls is is there with a, a friendly uh, smile for you. They've got a tough question sometimes. Absolutely not. But a tough question doesn't mean it's a bad question. No, it doesn't. It means it's a real concern to some somebody. And, and in a political race, there are lots of tough questions and tough accusations, some of which are false. Which is also a tough situation. I, I'm hoping you can straighten out a couple of those I'll things try. today because people have asked me a couple of things. Good. And I said, I really don't know, but if uh, we get him in here, we can ask him about that. Great. I appreciate okay. that opportunity. Senator uh, Kel Seliger, this was uh, November 16th. This was released, press release, announced he's been endorsed by the top statewide pro life group Life Pack, mm-hmm. which is the political branch of Texans for Life. And then here's another one that came out on November 30th. Uh, another uh, top pro-life organization, Texas Alliance for Life, mm-hmm. a political action committee formally endorsed Kel Seliger mm-hmm. in his re-election. I know you're real uh, proud of these endorsements. I am. Uh, they say something. Oh, yes, they do. They say something. And they get people, to, like me, their attention. Because I, I look see who's supporting and who's not supporting. Sure. Somebody. This one was on December 1st. Press release said the nation's top authority on gun rights, the National Rifle Association, awarded Republican State Senator Kel Seliger their coveted A rating and announced their endorsement for his candidacy for re-election. Yes, they did. By the way, I noted that I had marked on one of those previous endorsements this statement from, uh, uh, let's see, this. I'm trying to see who made this statement here, quoting... Anyway, Texas uh, Right to Life said a, a 
Oh, he's quoting you. I'm proud to defend the lives of the unborn in our state. This past session, we banned partial birth abortions, banned dismemberment abortions, defunded Planned Parenthood, and extended the Maternal Mortality Task Force. Gail Seliger said the right to protect innocent lives is an uphill battle, but we must continue fighting until every one of them is safe. I want to continue reading your endorsements in a moment, but let's camp on this one just a moment. Let's do it. Because Planned Parenthood is one of the questions that, that I've had submitted to me because there's a newspaper article you know about. From that. 2004 originally. Yeah, which uh, said the Planned Parenthood gathering here was hosted by certain people, including Kel and Nancy Seliger. Uh-huh. So, so tell me about that. Okay. <laughs> One, nobody has ever showed you anything documentary that's had me on an invitation or an attendance list on a program uh-huh. because it does not exist. Okay. I don't know who came up with this, but in 2004, it came up in the election. Huh. It was covered by the newspaper. And even the president of Planned Parenthood at the time said, I hadn't been to any of their, their events and things. Wow. Uh, most recently, I think, I don't know whether it was Mike Cannon or, or Victor Liao came up with that, with absolutely no documentary evidence. It wasn't true in 2004, uh-huh. and it's not true today. Okay. So the only reason that Globe News printed that is because somebody told them. Somebody made the accusation huh. with no evidence whatsoever. Okay. But but the, these groups that have endorsed you, as I said, they speak a lot about the issue because neither one of these pro-life groups would have endorsed you no. wholeheartedly if you had even uh, a couple of votes that were, that were pro-abortion instead of pro-life. Absolutely not. If, and somebody said I did something that provided funding for Planned Parenthood, that I voted against a rider. That rider was to make sure that money went to organizations that we don't have. Uh And I wanted the money to become available, not to Planned Parenthood, but to the Coalition of Health Services and Hospital Districts like the ones here in Dumas and Dalhart to provide prenatal care, cancer screenings, breast cancer screenings, uh, pap smears to poor women. Uh Who could possibly object to that? I don't know if you have met or if your listeners have met Joe Poyman of, of Texas Alliance for Life oh, or, or Kylene Wright at, at the Texas Coalition for right, Life. Uh-huh. They are 100% pro-life with a focus that can best be described as laser-like. They don't do endorsements for people who are not thoroughly pro-life. Even Texas Right to Life didn't endorse me for whatever reason, but they gave me 100% on their pro-life scorecard. Uh-huh. 100%. That's it. Okay, that's interesting. I appreciate you answering that question. And by the way, I've seen things in the newspaper about me that weren't true. So so I know that the newspaper can print something that's not I would true. like to discuss what somebody said about you that was, <laughs> that was derogatory and untrue. Well, it, it happened quite a while ago, back in the 80s, but uh, it was interesting. Anyway, uh, here's another press release from December 20th that uh, says that uh, Senator Seliger has a consistent record of Second Amendment victories in the Texas Senate. He voted to pass Texas open carry law and cut the license to carry fee to the lowest in the nation. That's interesting. And and the thought there, Ricky, was we don't need to be making money on permits. Let's make sure that we cover DPS costs of doing the the background checks and things that they have to do and go and let people – Let's not let's not make the cost there a hindrance to people who want to exercise their Second Amendment rights. I've been a concealed carry. I was it was concealed carry then, since 1996. Okay. And um, I, it's it's the Second Amendment. Uh-huh. Uh, I'm also endorsed in addition to the Texas State Rifle Association, the NRA, the Texas Wildlife Conservation Organization. And for the life of me, I can't figure out that, what that is. Except when I go hunting, I very often don't hit anything, which I assume is wildlife conservation. Okay. I'm I'm enjoying your humor this morning. Uh, Well, I've had a lot of coffee already. I mean, uh, uh, the uh, shooting that just happened, you know, the Democrats are real quick to run to the cameras and talk about demolishing our Second Amendment, to put it in my words, uh, but that's not the solution. What is the solution to these school shootings? I don't know that there, there is a solution. School security, first and foremost. 
when you and I went to school, if there was any physical risk, it was from the school bully, and that's happened forever. Yeah. But think about everything that the Democrats suggest. What if those things that were in place would have stopped this shooting from happening? Yeah, nothing. Nothing. Clearly, there's some things that we need to do, and this kid shouldn't have had a gun. The guy in Las Vegas shouldn't have had a gun, and they already said that the protective things were, were not followed. Mm-hmm. Um, what we need to do is energetically enforce the laws in place right now. That's the most important yeah. thing to do. How about, how about arming teachers? I, even half of them, you know, if not all of them. Down in, we had this discussion the other night, and down near, somewhere near um, Wichita Falls, teachers are armed, but they're very well trained, first of all, uh-huh. and they do things like have guns mm-hmm. in the classroom in a lockbox, mm-hmm. where if the lockbox is opened by some biometric measure, an alarm goes off in the school office and the police so that they know that a gun has been accessed to ensure that everybody knows that there's a gun out somewhere or that somebody views a threat. Uh-huh. And I don't know all the details, but that's sort of the things uh-huh. I was told. There are ways to do that. You've got to be very careful when people are carrying a gun in an armed situation yeah. because let's say, let's say an English teacher is protecting his kids has a gun and is walking down the hall of school. And here come the police. Now, they're going to be in groups of two or three. That's uh-huh. that's the way they work things. Uh-huh. It's a very, very tense situation. And here's the teacher, and they're yelling at him to put down the gun. And he says, that's, he holds up his gun and say, we're safe. I've got this gun. You go wave a gun around in an active shooter situation, and the police are going to fire. Yeah, yeah, you don't yeah, want to yeah, lose yeah. a teacher that way, and that's why the training deal is as important as everything else. Yeah, yeah. Well, I like the concealed idea. You know, there's, uh, there would never be a mass shooting in our church like there was in that church a few months ago because we have several people that are armed every Sunday, but you never see them. I mean, you never see the, 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 the guns, but they're there, and if somebody came in, uh, they would uh, they would go meet their maker real quick. And and when somebody comes in, is the concealed part is good because they don't know who is dangerous. Right. They need to assume that everyone is dangerous. Yeah. yeah. But when we talk about that that church shooting, in in a way that was significant in this context to me, if you were to have thought, what is the safest place in America? You <laughs> would have said the a small town yeah. church yeah. in central Texas on Sunday morning. Uh-huh. If that is not safe, Ricky, where are we safe? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you'd think the same thing about schools, wouldn't you? Sure you would. Yeah. Well, anyway, Seliger played a key role in passing the campus carry law that allows students at public universities to protect themselves. So I think we've covered that subject really well, and I appreciate all that information. Thank you. We have a caller on right now. Caller, you're on the air. You have a question or a comment for Senator Seliger? Yes, I do. Good morning, uh, Senator and Ricky. Good morning. Dave Nichols. Yeah, Dave Nichols. Yes. Uh, Kel may not remember me, but we knew each other a while back. Uh-huh. Good. Um, if it was when you were kids, it was a long time ago. Oh, thank well, you. It was back in the 80s, <laughs> a few decades ago. Okay. Anyway, Senator, uh, there's a big issue. I appreciate y'all talking about the abortion issue and the gun issue. But there's another big issue about school vouchers right now. Right. And you're not the only one that's asked that. That's on my list over here from another yes. caller. So address that. One, one, one of my concerns is that there's a lot of people that are paying thousands of dollars in taxes every year to government schools, and they're not even sending their kids to government schools. Right. So they're getting double taxed because they got to pay for the private school, and then they got to pay for the government schools, and they don't mm-hmm. even send them to yeah. Well, what really, I guess, irks me is my wife and I have never had children, but we have always paid our taxes to the government schools, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that's not right. I yeah. think people that don't even have kids <laughs> shouldn't have to support the government schools. Yeah, That's just an opinion, but uh, you've got the mic now. Okay, thank yeah. you, Dave. And, 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 and I, I respect that opinion. We are not paying taxes for our kids' schooling. We are paying taxes for a local school system that that is is one constitutionally required, and two, it's how we're going to educate our workforce for the future, and we all benefit from that. So, do I uh, take that that you're against vouchers? 
I voted against the, the voucher bill, and here's why. Okay. The voucher bill was to be the only area in, in, in state finance where we put government money in with no government accountability whatsoever. We don't do it with roads. We don't do it with prisons. We don't do it. We certainly don't do it with public schools. They have a uh, lot of state requirements. Uh, the other thing, and, and why my opponents support this, I don't, I don't know, because to provide public money for private schools, we won't let public schools do this, to teach common core and to teach radical philosophies. There are 18 Muslim schools in the state of Texas. Last time I checked, six months ago. Uh-huh. Who knows what they teach? That is their business like it is for any religious school under the First Amendment. Yeah. We must defend their right to do that. But providing uh, public dollars for a Muslim school or a Wiccan school or, or whatever, I'm opposed to that then and I'm opposed to it now. Okay, okay. Well, uh, we, we do want you to help us protect our Christian and private schools. That's a, that's a different kind of issue, but uh, you're, you're, you're not... Uh, you're not anti-Christian or private schools. You just don't believe that a voucher is a way to. You have a right to get, provide your child any education you want. Some people do a great job of homeschooling. A lot of the religious yeah. schools, Amarillo is a, a really good example, very good Christian schools that have a right to teach anything that they want to. Yeah. Um, We're starting one at our church, and we just announced it a couple of weeks ago and already had more than 60 people inquiring about it. Yeah, and, and schools here like St. Mary's yeah, does, a, does an absolutely great job. When I was mm-hmm. growing up in Borga, the really only private school we had was a Catholic school, St. John's, which was excellent. But what happens when the Islamic school buys land right next to yours and they decide that they're going to teach a philosophy that is anti-Bible, anti-American, anti-Israel? They have every right to do that. Yeah, yeah. My opponents support providing them public money for, to teach that. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I'm not in favor of that. Okay. Okay. But you are open to uh, listening to arguments. Sure. From, from people. <laughs> people. Some of you know me, for example. I pay two thirds of my property tax goes to fund the schools. Sure it does. And I said that to Warren Chisholm once, and he said, "What well, two thirds of the state tax does too? Sales tax." So that means uh, I'm putting a lot in the schools that I don't personally believe in. My children all attended a Christian school that sure. we that we operated. For 19 years in Wheeler, and then we moved over here, and we're about to start another one. So. Oh, yeah, and I'll listen to arguments. Please keep in mind, I'm married. I'm used to argument. <laughs> I told you I like your humor. <laughs> this is good. Uh, and, and we need to redo our system of school finance and to address the fact, because as the state has reduced its share of, of school finance from 60% some years ago to the current 37%, uh-huh. your burden has gone up. And it shouldn't. You know what? You mentioned the, that uh, education. Remind me, I forgot to tell people I was going to at the beginning of this uh, interview that you are on the following committees. Mm-hmm. Higher education. And in fact, you chair that committee. I do. Select Committee on Government Facilities, Education, Finance Committee, and Natural Resources and Economic Development. Uh, so you've been around a while and you've uh, your, your tenure helps to uh, to give you these positions sure does uh, i've talked to mac thornberry about right uh you know term limits mm-hmm. because there's always uh a lot of talk about that and uh he and i agree and i think you would too i i think it would be great if it was straight across the board required of everybody but self-imposed term limits uh lead to us getting rid of some of our better people sometimes because they impose it upon themselves and they leave the Nancy Pelosi's and Chuck Schumer's of the world to stay in there endlessly. It's the argument goes on, and, and clearly the president of the United States is limited to, to two terms, and that's enough, and it works fine. Yeah. Um, there are people who say we have term limits right now, and it's, they're called elections. Yeah. But it's such a small percentage of people go vote, especially in the primaries. Oh, it's it's pitifully small. Uh, I can tell you this. I am not going to be in the Texas Capitol wheeled around in a wheelchair drooling on my tie. <laughs> okay. I appreciate that. Yeah. That's, that's, that's good. Uh, let's see. Let's get through these rest of these endorsements, and I'll get to some more questions here. Senator Kel Seliger announced his endorsement in January uh, by Ag Fund, the political committee of the Texas Farm Bureau. Right. I think Texas Farm Bureau, uh, it, it's nonpartisan, but it's known as a, a conservative group. 
Uh, it is in very ag focused, and and yeah. we are an agricultural area of the state. Yeah, yeah. Dedicated to promoting agricultural and protection of private property rights to the state and federal level, Seliger has been endorsed also by the National Rifle Association, as we, as we said earlier. But that was repeated in that uh, press release. Here's another one from February sixth. Senator State Senator Kel Seliger announced his endorsement by Texas and Southwestern Cattle Raisers Association PAC. And the, and the Texas Cattle Feeders, which is probably one of the, the strongest advocacy groups for their industry anywhere in the country. Yeah. Uh, personally, I'll tell you that these kind of endorsements mean more to me than the Globe News endorsement. And, uh, and you know, that's not something necessarily being despised, but, uh, you know, Globe News is not always. Uh, well, for example, yesterday's article here by uh, Mark Ballou, he referred, Mark Ballou, yeah. He referred to the. The bathroom bill is a silly bill, and they've taken that position at the Globe News, and they do things like that from time to time that irritate me. You voted on our side mm-hmm. on the bathroom bill, mm-hmm. so I'm I'm assuming, I'm not wanting to put words in your mouth, you can answer yourself, that, that you agree with us that it wasn't a silly thing. It's a matter of protecting our, our wives, our children, our granddaughters from people that would take advantage of, there were some there were some genuine concerns, but in the criminal sense, there were no reported violations. Yeah, privacy I think is an important issue, but the thing went off the rails because at some point, because of a lot of pressure from the business community, we exempted all those business industry, all those businesses or, or all those bathrooms that are in private businesses. There is no less risk of sexual assault or violation of privacy. Mm-hmm. in a a stadium bathroom than there is a county courthouse. That's right. And so folks messed up the bill. Privacy is an, is, is an important issue. I'm not sure that one's coming back. Okay, okay. So so clarify what your specific position is on that. You, well, I voted for the bill. And I, you would vote I, for it again if it included everything. It's going to have to include everything. Otherwise, it's discriminatory. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, by the way, for voting for that. That's, yeah. why, that's why I was down there back in March. Okay. And Because uh, that was a big deal going on back then. Oh, it was. Yeah. And uh, I was really ticked off at Strauss because he's the one guy that stopped it from being passed. And even then, every single city council in, in the state of Texas can pass an ordinance right now. The issue is not dead just because the bill didn't pass the legislature. That's good. If, if people call City Hall and say we want something like that in bathrooms in, in the, the city limits of Amarillo, it can be done. That is good. I'm glad you said that. Thank yeah. you. People shouldn't wait around for the state to take action in areas where people can do that themselves. Yeah. yeah. And tomorrow, everybody in Amarillo can go down and see the city council and, and tell them. Not everybody can come down to Austin and Talk to us. They're all yeah. welcome. But. Yeah. Well, it's not easy to get down there and, and, and make the rounds. No, uh, it's not. Conservative. Uh, now, this says conservative state center. Mm-hmm. So you advertise yourself as conservative. Absolutely. Every you, minute of every day. But you're fully aware of this uh, Rice University uh, fellow that uh, wrote this article. Yes. Uh, Mark Jones. Yes, that's right. And he's got a chart here. And list you as the most liberal of all of the Republicans. So you've seen that chart. Where I am is, in his view, the least conservative. What they also point out is there are no liberal Republicans. Oh, yeah. Well, I point this out to people there last night. no time. liberal Republicans. As close as I can tell, Rice University is using the same criteria as Empower Texans and, and Texans for Fiscal Reform and Empower Texans. Texas Public Policy Foundation, the most anti-public education, anti-local control organizations in Texas. Uh And so here we have this group in Austin, these three groups associated in Austin, Uh in Houston. Why do I care what people at Rice University think? I'm not a Houston senator. I represent the Texas Panhandle. So instead of checking with Empower Texans and Mark Jones, Uh I call county judges and county commissioners and school board members and mayors in the Texas Panhandle. Mine is a a a District 31 vote. This is important. My opponents are lackeys of Empowered Texans, Texas Public Policy Foundation. They're owned by them, and their votes will be strictly according to what those people say they will be. Or they'll get them primary opponents next time like they did me. Yeah, yeah. And I'm going to vote my district. I'm not going to vote downtown Houston. 
Okay, okay. Well, I appreciate that. Houston's a liberal place. Oh, my gosh. Anyway, I told the people in our Bible study last night, I said, I'm going to ask uh, Senator Seliger about this in the morning because, mm -hmm. and I said, I said, on the chart, he's he's to the right of every Democrat down there. Sure. And uh, so we'll ask him about uh, about that. And so that's. that's Let me point do. something out. Okay. I think the most conservative person in politics of Texas today is the lieutenant governor. Yeah. He had 30 prime issues, and those were the most important things for us to address in the session, in his estimation. Uh -huh. I voted for 28 of them. It's a 933 batting average in Houston Astros terms, which is darn good. T give me those stats. At nine, at 20, you voted for 20. 28 out of 30. Out of 30, okay. And that's not conservative? I'm not 100 percenter because the lieutenant governor doesn't own this vote either. Yeah. The people in the 31st district do. I'd, yes, I was going to ask you what issues you have with the lieutenant governor because uh, aren't you, is it true that you're the only Republican senator that did not endorse him for re yes. election? Yes, and and I was perfectly willing to, and and we had a very cordial conversation. He didn't endorse me. Oh, as a practical matter, okay. Why well, would I endorse somebody who didn't endorse me if my endorsement is good for him? Isn't his endorsement good for me? Well, that's a good question. Why didn't he ador endorse you? He didn't endorse any sitting senators at the time. Really? Yeah, and told me he wasn't going to. He since has, but he told me he wasn't going to get into endorsements, and which I accept. Yeah. That's fine. But you and he get along, okay? Yeah. Are we are we best friends? No, he's got other best friends, and that's fine. But once again, he doesn't control this vote either. Yeah, yeah. Well, as lo as long as you're entertaining the idea of putting restrictions on ice TV, you and I are not best friends. But it's it's really a tax. <laughs> Ricky, a tax. Okay, it's a ta we can reduce property tax uh, if we increase taxes on ICA. Okay, hey, now that brings up another serious <laughs> question. Somebody asked about the property tax because you voted twice with the Democrats. And this is according to a listener to kill property tax reform, and the only Republican who did that. So let's let's talk about that. It wasn't going to reduce anybody's property taxes. What it was going to do was, if you have, we already have a rollback. Your city commission cannot raise taxes more than or, or net revenues over 8% without having a rollback election by petition. Okay. This one was 4%, which gets your city and county in a position where they may very well have to raise taxes every year. If you go to a place like Farwell and Wheeler and some places on your board here, uh, 25 to 4% won't buy a patrol car if they get one destroyed it won't buy a road maintainer uh -huh. it's not really good so what i did was then the house sent us a bill that said how about six percent i talked to people like the mayor of dalhart yeah and he said it, that really it's not necessarily good policy but it doesn't hurt us because we're not going to raise taxes six percent and so i thought okay and then republican leadership no we have to have everything we want or there will be absolutely nothing and so Republicans passed up a better situation, arguably, than we have now in favor of getting exactly everything that, that some people wanted. Um, we could have compromised ourselves to a more economical position and did not. Okay, okay. Thank you. for. This is one thing that I've always appreciated about you. And no matter what question I throw at you, you're willing to tackle it and answer it and, and not just skirt around it in a political way. I try not to because so many people who ask me questions are smart enough to know when I'm skirting it. Yeah. And so why bother? <laughs> yeah, but that's the truth. Uh, let me finish these endorsements here. Uh, you were an endorsed by the Department of Public Safety Officers Association. Mm -hmm. The uh, DPSOA official said, we believe that Senator Seliger has a strong record of supporting effective law enforcement. We want to recognize his efforts to lower crime. The work of Senator Seliger is keeping Texans safe. Well, it's nice. It's nice to get that word, isn't it? Yes, sir. Here's another one. Conservative State Senator Kel Seliger announced today he's been endorsed by Combined Law Enforcement Association of Texas. So that was on February 8th. And here's one. Senator Seliger announced on the 30th of January his endorsement by Impact, the political arm of the Texas Association of Manufacturers. Right. And they said, Tony Bennett, president of that group, said, we proudly support a proven candidate like Senator Seliger, who has demonstrated a commitment to growing jobs and keeping manufacturing strong in our state. Sounds uh, like and I hope we're going to talk about Texas Association of Business. Do it. Let's do it. Texas Association of Business is, it is exactly what it, it says it is. 
businesses, big and small, all over the state. When we talk about big, we're talking about ExxonMobil and American Airlines. And they're supporting candidates who work to have a good business environment in the state of Texas, and we do. Um, there's some others in there, but you've you've uh, the uh, the the firefighters association of the state of Texas. Yeah. And I'm particularly proud of those those first responders because they are the first responders. Those are the people when a house catches fire and we're trying to get our family out, they go in. Well, I'm going to say this: that you're you're endorsed by the kind of groups that I like. Oh, me too. And so that's uh, I think that's a a big. Uh, thing for people to, to know about. I think they're important groups. Now, I had a caller this morning that said, please ask him, why not do more for elderly people? And uh, I don't know if he's talking about that granny tax deal or not, but uh, what are we doing for elderly people? We talk about doing things for the vets, doing things for the school children. What we try to do is <clears throat> put enough money in Medicaid match, most of which goes to uh assisted living and things like that Mm -hmm. that's particularly important one of the most important areas is retired teachers their pensions are very small they average about fifteen hundred dollars and we need to keep that pension which has about 120 billion dollars we need to keep it actuarially sound because those teachers need to depend upon that for their entire lives and they will then there's that part of that that is the health care tax it's called texas retirement system care Uh we put a half billion dollars in there because of the increasing cost of premiums based upon the increasing cost of health care. Okay. And that's pretty much the situation we're going to be in in the future, and, and I support it. Those teachers have, um, it's, it's the promise, it's the, the, the pact that we've made with them, and we must carry through on it. A lot of people want to reduce their pension. It won't inevitably reduce it from what's called the current uh, defined benefit, so they know mm-hmm. what they're getting next month and the next month. To one to a system that may will fluctuate along with the markets, which means they may get fifteen hundred next month and nine hundred the, the following month. We cannot tolerate that, uh-huh. and I'm opposed to that change to go to the, what's called a defined contribution plan. Once again, teachers have expected that we promised it, and we must carry through on that promise. I'll tell you one thing: you're knowledgeable on all these issues we've been talking about. I fell down on my job uh, from the last time we talked because you had agreed. To, uh, t- to take a call from me periodically when the session was in session and bring us up to some sure. of these things you're talking about they could have already known about if we had had those visits sure so uh, if you if you are reelected we and you will be if you win the primary sure uh, because there's no Democrat running so that's good <laughs> if you fell down on your job Ricky consider yourself on probation and it's something you can work on Okay, okay. Now, you, you're familiar with this, and you've already addressed the group. Uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, the uh, Empower Texas mm-hmm. group. But I want to talk about the issue they raised. This came in my mailbox Saturday, right. Saturday as I was contemplating this interview. And it says that Kel Seliger has repeatedly killed bills to stop this high-priced priced handout to those who break the laws, putting illegal aliens ahead of American students. In other words, the issue is uh, in-state tuition to illegal aliens. Find me the vote. I'm the chairman of higher education. Yes, sure. There is no bill that came up for a vote. I did no such thing. This group of, well, they're mostly millionaires, but some of them are billionaires, are seeking not just to, to influence policy, but to own those seats. Uh And if they help you get elected, they own that seat, and they will text you how to vote on every vote in the Capitol. That is a bad form of government. Mm -hmm. And so, and they will say anything. Most recently they said in a Victor Leal ad that I had business interests within Austin lobbyist. Absolutely false, if you look at it. I think what they're talking about was when I was in a wheelchair, I had some business to tend to, and I need a lawyer. And so I hired a lawyer. He did the work. I paid him. We are not in business together. We have no shared interest. I needed a lawyer, and, and this was one people told me was a really good one. That's what I did. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That is not a business interest with the lawyer. Here's what's interesting. If you have a business interest with a lawyer, and you don't put it on your ethics sheet, it's a violation of state law. But you'll notice Mr. Leal hasn't find, filed a complaint with the Ethics Commission who would fine me. Uh-huh. And if he had any guts, that's what he'd do. 
And then he could go down there, and I'd go down there and explain the situation and how it comes out. And that's why when, in your, in your view, and you're a good person to ask as a minister, when is it conditionally okay to say things that are absolutely false? It's not. Ah, uh, but in politics, apparently, in some people's view, it is. And I have a problem with that. Well, I do, too. I do, too. Uh, hey, I forgot. To, I should have been repeatedly given the phone number. 806-359-8855, extension, well, extension zero, so that Diana can transfer your call in here and get you on the air. Uh, but a lot of these questions came in in the last two hours when I was telling people you were going to be here. Uh, gay marriage, what does Kel Seliger think about gay marriage? I think where we are right now, we are where we are. Uh, I voted for the original amendment to the Texas Constitution in 2005. The Supreme Court said it's unconstitutional. That's where we are. And the Supreme Court decisions are, can't be reversed by the state, but by, no, the, by it, the federal government. Only by amendment to the Constitution or Supreme Court. Yeah, but okay, your personal uh, position on gay marriage. I, I don't necessarily think it's a, a very good idea. I don't have much orientation toward it i am in a conventional marriage and and things like that and it's some, something until it came up in the legislature i didn't much think about it yeah is nancy listening this morning because you said a while ago you're you you being married you were used to arguments <laughs> i did say that <laughs> I, she might be listening she's i know she's at the gym and i know she's got some headphones on sometimes she would rather listen to aretha franklin than me oh <laughs> sometimes she'd rather listen to anybody but me but <laughs> okay caller you're on the air good morning I think I'll have to have that caller call back. I didn't have it uh, connected properly here, so call me right back, and we'll get you on the air here. Uh, church affiliation. Mm-hmm. Tell me about that, because that was a question that was submitted by a listener this morning. I'm Jewish, and, uh, and, and in a most interesting context, too, because my wife is a member of First Baptist Church of Amarillo. Uh-huh. My children were baptized at what was then Paramount Terrace Christian Church. Uh-huh. And so we are a mixed marriage of, of, of the real kind. So, so is your home based on the Judeo-Christian ethic? I've asked you that before. It's based on, yeah, I guess it, <laughs> it, it's, it's based upon the ethics of the people who live there. Yeah. yeah. And clearly it is it's Jewish and Christian and mutually respectful yeah. and, and honoring and things like that. And uh, Do you go to church with her sometimes? I was at First Baptist church? church last week. Okay. I'm a big fan of, of guys here in town. Two two of the people who have been friends of mine for a long time were the late Roy Wheeler. Yeah. And uh, uh, Burt Palmer and Howard Batson are friends of mine. I don't know if you've ever met the guy who's the head of Texas Pastors for Children, Charles Foster Johnson, who's a Baptist minister in, in Fort Worth. No, I have not. Who's a, you ought to look at some of this stuff. you would okay. be very impressed. He was here. And his message is uh, its absolutely an inspirational one. He and I have gotten to be really good friends, and he's one of the people I admire most. Well, oh, great. Man, okay. unquestioned principle and adherence to the religious principles that he preaches. Okay. Caller, you're on the air with Senator Kel Seliger. Uh, yes, Mr. Seliger, I heard you uh, answer that man's question earlier about the uh, vouchers. Uh-huh. I noticed several times that you stated uh, public money and state money. That's our money. That's my money. That's Ricky's money. And what I want to see on that, I don't know how the whole voucher bill was written, but it's for me and my family. We're homeschoolers, and I don't have a problem with paying my taxes and helping with education, but I think that I should have the right to be able to submit a, a uh, return to the state and show that I use this amount to educate my children in the way I choose and receive a refund from those state taxes because I didn't take advantage of the government school system. Mm-hmm. Hey, there's a little bit of difference. So what I use oh, excuse to me, educate I thought... my children, I should get back. Okay, thank you for your comment. I appreciate that. And, and I think in uh, connection with what he said, there's a difference between tax credit and vouchers. Entirely different tax credit. And one of my opponents said, well, I... Uh, I support in tax credits. Well, okay. That, but those money do not come out of the monies that go into our school program. Uh-huh. 
The majority of people in Texas who pay taxes probably do not have children in school. And so if we did not tax them, the school system, 5.8 million kids that we are constitutionally obligated to provide would absolutely collapse. Yeah. I think there may be some people who want to see that situation, but we can't allow it to happen. Okay. I'm not sure we finished the question on in-state tuition because I had another caller okay. that uh, has texted me about that, that in-state tuition is not Leal's people. I don't, did you answer that a while ago? Do you, do you favor in-state tuition for illegal aliens? I'm waiting. To, we're going to get some guidance from that from President Trump, and I'm very eager to see what he does because there's also eligibility for Pell Grants, government grants for those people, and I'm sort of looking for the federal model. In truth, in a lot of schools, what this does is creates an inequality because what a lot of schools that have a lot of money will say, okay, you don't get in-state tuition, but we'll make up the difference at $1,000 a semester. Yeah. I'm not sure West Texas A&M can do that or um, – so Ross and things like that. We need yeah. to have a situation that everybody can handle. Are you differentiating between legal and illegal aliens, legal immigrants and illegal aliens? That's a good question, Ricky, and, and, and help me understand it. If you take what we call a DREAM Act kid who was brought to this country when they're three years old, keep in mind their parents committed a crime. Yeah. The children committed no crime because a three-year-old can't commit a crime. Right. And so how do we treat them? Because it would not be a sanction to get somebody who broke federal law or immigration law. How do we deal with that? And that's what I'm hoping as President Trump works through this issue, and he's been doing it, I think, mm -hmm. in, a, in a concentrated fashion, how we're going to go from there and how they're going to treat it in the federal context. All right. Give me, give me about two, two or three more minutes. We're a little bit over time, but uh, I did have a couple more questions from listeners here. Okay. One of them wanted you to... Uh, address the issue of chemtrails. Uh, you know, there's uh, sometimes a lot of people get concerned about that, and she wanted to know. Uh, I, I'm forgetting the exact question now. I forgot where it went. <laughs> but uh, what what are they doing up there, and why are these? Uh, what, what, what's the deal with the chemtrails? I'm following the thing. It's something I hadn't heard of before. Yeah. And I'm not sure exactly where they come from and how they develop and things like that. And so I'm waiting for people, both the, the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality and the Department of Public Safety, to tell me how they work. Yeah. Okay. I can't tell you. <laughs> I was counting on you. <laughs> well, I really can't because that is an issue that uh, I think people get overworked up about. Uh, yeah, that's sort of I, like the Jade Helm 15 thing. That was, yeah. Yeah. Uh, because I think, you know, the way I think about it, these pilots up there and all these planes, they would know what they're doing, and they have to come down and live under these camp. You know, some people sure say they that do. they're gassing us to, to, to control us, and, and so I don't, I don't know enough about it to, to be intelligent and ask. Here's anybody. one of those situations is long term they may be, there may be some effect. Do I think there is, is some intention to affect the public? No, I don't. Yeah. Um, it's, it's something that we research, and airplanes are so much cleaner than they used to be. You don't see big billows of smoke come out every time you start an airplane. Yeah. At the same time, we can always go back to the 19th century and, and do away with air travel, but we have emissions from cars and trains and yeah, things yeah, like that, yeah, too. Yeah. So where is that mix? Well, I know sometimes they seed the clouds, and that's a, that's a different issue, I think, but... Uh, Chemtrails in the skies, uh, are we protected from chemicals being released in our atmosphere is what they're concerned about. So, And uh, that's something that if uh, we find out more about it, we'll talk to you about it. Absolutely. Because you're always available. Always available. To talk to me, and I thank you for that. Uh, will vehicle inspections be a thing of the past? Yes, I think so. And I think we've greatly limited them now, and they came to me last year and i think i co-sponsored that bill and what we found is is um the vehicles that are inspected are no safer than others and this doesn't do anything the state gets most of the money our local garages do not yeah and <laughs> and i talked to bob lang at lang tire for instance yeah it means nothing to them they don't really get very much money out of it um i think we can go without vehicle inspections okay kufa you familiar with kufa christians united for israel yes and uh, there's a guy that wants us to have you come to our church sometime and talk to us in our in our new church uh, school 
uh, in, in, uh, involved in the situation to uh, meet and greet and talk to people, answer all of their detailed questions about vouchers. So we may have to. I'd be glad to do that. I'm a big fan of Pastor John Hagee. Yeah. And yeah. there is probably among Christian pastorate probably no more fervent supporter of, of Israel than, than he is. And I think he's done a lot of good. But one of the things that he said when he was here in Amarillo sort of resonated with me. And he said that people who have religious biases are not living according to the word of God. And this is, I, I think he's a Baptist minister. John Hagee. Uh-huh. This, uh, yeah, I think he's an independent church. Maybe. And uh, I'm a big fan of, of his. I am, too. Well, hey, I've, I've uh, imposed upon you and taken advantage of you by keeping you overtime. You've done and, me a big favor by having me on once again, and I appreciate it. And Jenna uh, Jenna will be chomping at the bits so if she didn't come to give me signal, wrap this up, wrap it up. Time, she, time limit's over. Now she knows she's going to have to be here the next time to, <laughs> to control things. <laughs> Thank you, Thank Senator you. Seliger. I appreciate your willingness to always talk and answer any question I have for you. Thank I, you. I appreciate it. Thank you very much.